In chapter 14, verse 28, Jesus says, The Father is greater than I. Now think about this. Christians, we believe that Jesus is God. Here Jesus is saying that the Father is greater than he is. And so that would mean what? Here's Jesus that we claim is God. And here's the Father who's greater than him. So there's this greater God, right? Exactly. So you have the greater God and the lower God. Christians, we believe in polytheism, right? Precisely. Two gods, one greater than the other. How All do you right. avoid this? Yeah. Now, Sam. Yes. This is probably the most important passage that, that he quoted, so we'll obviously spend a little more time on this passage than on some of the others. But yeah. what happens? What happens when we start looking at this passage in context? Do you get the impression this guy is someone who's just claiming to be a prophet? <clears throat> if you actually read John 14, 28, just within the chapter itself, and again, I trust the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to enable both you and I by his spirit to do justice to these passages. If you look at John 14, 28 in the context <clears throat> itself, just the chapter, I'm not talking about looking at 13 or 15 or 16. Just look at the chapter itself. Jesus goes out of his way to affirm not only that he's distinct from the Father, he's not the Father, we don't believe Jesus is the Father, but that he's essentially co-equal with the Father in divine nature, <clears throat> power, and glory. <clears throat> in fact, let me just start at John 14, verse 6, for the sake of time. Let me look at verse 6 and show you how Jesus' statements are incompatible with Islam and Jesus' statements prove, from an Islamic perspective, he's claiming to be God. <clears throat> in John 14, 6, the Lord Jesus says, in response to Thomas, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth. In Arabic, al-haq. But anyone can claim that, right? Any, any prophet oh, can claim to be al-haq. We'll see. We'll see if that's the case. I am the way and the truth and the life. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say, I point you to life and I proclaim the truth. I myself am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Number one, Jesus is our way to the Father. Islam denies that God is the Father to anyone. And, and historically, <laughs> if you came out and said, I am the truth, you'd be killed. Yes, there, there was, was actually a Muslim Sufi, Sufi, you know, Sufi Al-Halaj, yeah. who was killed for saying that. Now notice Jesus says, I am the truth and the life. Now chapter 22, verse 6, lo and behold, who is the truth according to the Quran? Chapter 22, verse 6, this is because Allah, He is the truth. Right? <laughs> He's the truth, and it is he who gives life to the dead. We'll revisit that issue mm -hmm. of Allah giving life to the dead in a moment. So number one, in context, Jesus claims two of the very exclusive names of God, something no prophet would do. You quoted a verse to prove your point. From Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 6, which says, where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto my Father, but through me. Now, this is again quoting out of context. People pick up verses from the Quran and quote out of context to malign. Similarly, Christian missionaries quote the Bible out of context. I want to tell you a truth to you. You can open the Bible. If you doubt me, open the Bible. For the context, go to verse number 1. Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 1 says that, Why are you afraid? Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, If you have faith in God, have faith in me. In my Father's mansion, there are many houses. And I am going there to prepare a place for you. And when I go, I will tell you. So Thomas asked, Where thou art going? He said, Don't you know where I go? He said, No. Then he says that, Show us the way, where thou goest. So then Jesus Christ, peace be upon replies, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When Thomas asks, Jesus Christ, peace be upon show us the way to God. Then Jesus Christ, peace be upon replies, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto thy father but through me. We agree at the time of the messenger. Every messenger was the way, the truth, and the life. No man came unto God but through the way of that messenger. At the time of Jesus, I agree with the Bible that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was the way, the truth, and the life. No man came unto Almighty God but through the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. At the time of Moses, Moses was the way, the truth, and the life. No man came unto Almighty God but through the teachings of Moses, peace be upon him. But today, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, I have many things to say unto you. Further he says, in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14, I have many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. For he, when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. He shall not speak of himself, all that he hears shall he speak. He shall show you things to come, he shall glorify me. At today's time, at today's time, the messenger 
Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to Almighty God but through the teachings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Since Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last and final messenger, in today's age, irrespective whether a person is living in USA, in Canada, in UK, in India, in Saudi Arabia, any part of the world, for every human being today, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto Almighty God, but through the teachings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And this is what all the major scriptures say, including the Bible. What happens? What happens when we start looking at this passage in context? Now, Jesus applying the names of God to himself. Where did Jesus apply the names of God to himself? Okay, you say Jesus said I was Alpha and Omega. We refuted that because Jesus said he was dead. So is dead the names of God? Does God die? So obviously he's disclaiming and separating himself from being God. But what other names did he attribute to himself? He forgave. Okay, so we mentioned and we showed how other prophets and even God spoke to the prophets, uh, spoke to people through the prophets. He forgave by the authority of God. Now, this idea of the truth, it is in fact correct that al haq is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but just because Allah has his name does not mean that there are other descriptions in the world that would not bear this name as well so for instance Allah calls the truth itself like the Quran in the truth is, is the truth from your Lord so the message of Islam is also called Al-Haq it's called the truth this is the truth from your Lord, so don't deny. The Quran has a, a pledge of being the truth. This is the truth from your Lord, so do not deny. But I want to take you to another verse that's even even more uh, clear on refuting this whole idea of um, the name Al-Haq. In Surah Fusilat, which is chapter 41 of the Quran, verse 53, it says, We will show them our signs in the horizons and within themselves show them our signs on the horizons and within themselves it means that you have signs in the creation which you can see outside of you and you also have signs that people can see within inside themselves the heart the intelligence the way the body works the kidneys all these things these are miracles from God the way the body functions and stuff like that so God says that we will show them our signs on the horizons and within themselves until it becomes clear to them that this is the truth what's the truth the message that comes from God does this now mean somehow that the truth that God is showing is also God the signs and the miracles within a human being is also God. The signs on the horizons and that we see in creation is also God. Is all these things also considered God according to your understanding and your interpretation, David? No, not at all. This is foolish. But again, it's desperation. Do anything I can and say anything I can to try to prove that Jesus is God. Why? Because you have to. Because this is their doctrine. And if you can't prove it, then you have to find something, some way to reinterpret the Bible to make it so. You can't prove it with any clear verse. Remember the principle that we mentioned in the beginning, that we use clear verses to interpret unclear verses. And we're going to get to a couple of those in a minute. Um, but this is, we see, that just because the word Al-Haq is used, that Jesus says he's the truth, doesn't mean he's saying he's God. We're still looking for a verse, because this is what it's all about. We're still looking for a verse, or something even close to it, where Jesus actually said, I'm God. And when Jesus actually alluded to someone worshiping him. Because when we look in the New Testament, or the Old Testament rather, we find it quite clear that God emphatically emphatically stated that he was God and that all worship and devotion is due to him. What happens when we go to verses 12 and 14? What happens when we go to 12 and 14? Well, let's look at it. Same chapter, look what Jesus says. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do. Greater works, same word, greater. Greater works will he do because I am going to the Father. So in John 14, 12 to 14, Jesus says, you disciples will do greater works than me because I'm going to the Father. Now, what's the connection? What's the connection with Jesus going to the Father, resulting in the disciples doing greater number of works than Jesus, not better works? The answer comes in the verses following. Here's why. Whatever you ask in my name, this will I do. When I go to the Father, you will ask me, and I will perform these miracles through you at your behest, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now notice verse 14. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. In the very same chapter, Jesus says, you'll be able to do greater works than me when I go to the Father, because once I'm in heaven, in the very presence of the Father, you can direct your invocations to me. Now again, what else do we have? Well, John 14, 20 to 23. Talk about omnipresence. Again, for the sake of time, because we want to address other points, mm -hmm. let's just look at verse 23, and then you tell me, what is Jesus getting at? John 14, 23, Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. My Father will love him, and we, Father and I, we will come to him and make our home with him. Let me ask you a question. Here Jesus claims to be just as present, to the same degree, in the same sense that the Father is with all who truly love him. What kind of ability must Jesus have in order to dwell with every true believer, no matter where they're at, no matter how many? Well, there you need omnipresence. Seriously? Yeah. So you mean the same chapter, Jesus claimed the divine names of God, Jesus claimed the divine attributes of God, and Jesus made himself the object of worship and invocation, that same chapter? Yeah, because he's just a prophet. Okay. Right. And then isn't it clear that Jesus is claiming to be essentially co-equal to the Father? He's saying, I and the Father together will make our abode with every true believer. Does that sound like someone who thinks that he's less than the Father in essence and ability? Or co-equal to the Father in essence and divine attributes and characteristics? Well, then what, what could Jesus mean just a few verses later when he says the Father is greater than I? If he's maintaining his ability to answer prayers, his divine names, his divine attributes, and then turns right around and says the Father is greater than I, what, what, what do you do with that? Well, in, in the context we've established, greater does not mean greater in essence in nature of power and ability, clearly, because you can be greater in one of two senses. You can be greater than me in essence, like I'm greater than my dog in essence, or you can be greater than me in rank and position authority. You are greater than your children, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that doesn't make you a better human being than your children, right? Again, that's, a, that's an imperfect analogy because God is unlike creation. However, it drives the point home. Clearly, in the context, Jesus is not saying that the Father is better than me in essence. He just has gone out of his way to affirm that he's fully God and has the same ability and characteristics that the Father has. The interpretation that fits the context is right there if you read actually the entire verse. Let me read it, John 14, 28. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father. And here, here's the explanation. For the Father is greater than I. Now notice what he's saying. If you really loved me, you'd be happy that I'm leaving you because the Father is greater than I. Well, what's the connection here? You should be happy that I'm going to the Father because of this reason, the Father is greater than I. If you just read it there in isolation, it really doesn't make sense. Well, okay, we know, okay, if you're a prophet, then we know God is greater than you. What is because Jesus' point is simply this. If he remains on earth, he remains in the status and position of a slave, whereas the Father is in glory. The Father is basking in heavenly glory, <clears throat> whereas the Son is on earth in the state of, of humbleness. He's in the status of a servant. So what he's telling the disciples is if you love me, then you would rejoice that I go to the Father, because if I remain here, the Father remains greater in status. But when I return to glory... That won't be the case anymore. 
that this is what Jesus is saying is easily confirmed by the same gospel in John 17, verse 5. John 17, 5, notice what Jesus says, uh, David. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had. See, had it, doesn't have it now. The glory I had with you before the world existed. So Jesus is telling disciples, if I return to the Father, then the glory I had with him will be mine once again. But if I remain here, he'll remain greater in terms of status and glory. And by the way, can any creature say that he shared in the same divine glory with God before the world was created? Not according to the Bible, he can't. Can he demand that the Father give him back that glory that he had with, with God before the world began? No. But that's what Jesus claimed in John 17, verse 5. Yeah. So the meaning is, while I'm on earth, Jesus is in the status of, of a slave. But when he goes back, that situation will change. He'll regain the glory that he had with the Father so that from that point on, the Father won't be greater than him in that sense anymore. gave Jesus everything. The Father gave Jesus the miracles. Jesus prayed to the Father. The Father doesn't pray to Jesus. So in fact, Jesus is lesser than the Father in essence. So anyway, that's that. You can't prove Jesus is God. And I still have some more to say. Now anyway, it's good you say that when Jesus returned when he resurrected and so on, he returned back to the glory he once had. He was no more in the form of a servant. You said that. You said he returned to the glory that he once had. So wait a minute. If Jesus is back now in the glory he has, then why in Revelations, Revelations, which is now when he is in his glory, why does Jesus say in Revelations chapter 3, 12, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God. So if Jesus is now back with his Father in the glorified way he is, why is he still calling fa the Father my God? But now what you're going to tell me is that, oh, wait a minute, Jesus still has his man nature with him. So if Jesus still has his man nature with him, then that means he's not in his glory as he used to be, unless you're going to tell me that Jesus was forever a man, which, which I don't believe you are, unless you believe that. So anyway, you said Jesus went back to his glory, so why is he still calling the Father God when he is in his own glory? Ya ahla al-kitab la taghlu fi dinikum wa la taqulu ala allahi illa al-haq Innama al-masih Isa ibn Maryam rasulullahi wa kalimatuhu alqaha ila Maryam wa ruhum فآمنوا بالله ورسله ولا تقولوا ثلاثة انته خيرا لكم إنما الله إله واحد سبحانه سبحانه أن يكون له ولد له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وكفى بالله وكيلا اللهم صل على محمد يا رب العالمين اللهم صل على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم